Another group of insects that feeds on plants in a manner similar to aphids would be whiteflies. So this would be a different family of insects, uh, Allirodidae instead of the aphididae. And what is a whitefly and why are they called whiteflies? Well, the adult stage of essentially all whiteflies are white. So they're winged, uh, but there's a fine powder of wax on their wings. And so they are white and they fly. So uh, pretty straightforward. And you're going to find almost always either one of two species affecting uh, a crop indoors or out here in the United States. There are some others, but um, greenhouse whitefly would be the predominant species one would find indoors pretty much throughout the country. Uh, when you get to the southern part of the United States, uh, indoors and outdoors, uh, sweet potato whitefly becomes more important. Uh, as we'll get to, uh, whiteflies in the northern areas where we have freezing winters uh, are only surviving between seasons uh, in indoor protected sites. There are some other uh, whiteflies that are out there. A banded wing whitefly is one that also shows up occasionally on vegetables. There's also some that uh, go into ornamental plants, uh, particularly in more tropical areas uh, like southern Florida, Hawaii. Uh, several species of whiteflies are there found on, on various kinds of outdoor plants. In addition to the species, we're going to focus mostly here, uh, the greenhouse whitefly and, and sweet potato whitefly. So whiteflies have a simple metamorphosis. They're in the order Hemiptera, uh, but they have pretty considerable differences in their appearance and habit between the adult and young stage, the adult being the wing stage. So this would show the generalized life history, uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll go through this again, but you're going to have an adult, and the adult female would lay eggs. Uh, uh, the egg stage that hatches from the eggs, the instar one, we'll, we'll call it a crawler sometimes because that is a mobile period. Uh, and uh, after they have fed for a while and molted, they're the second stage, instar two, and they cease moving at that point. They feed for a while again, molt, they're the third stage. They feed for a while again, molt to a fourth stage. The interesting thing about the fourth stage that's different is that they don't feed during that. So it's a non-feeding stage. So three, three feeding stages is a immature form, a fourth non-feeding stage. Sometimes the term pupa is given to this. Technically, it's not a pupa. That's a, a different structure. It's the insects with complete metamorphosis have, but it's a convenient term to use. So eggs of white flies uh, may be scattered over the leaf, or, or they may be in patterns. Uh, many um, white flies will lay their eggs in a little semicircle. Uh, some will cover uh, the eggs with a little bit of wax, so you might see some powder. Uh, and uh, there's one group called the spiraling white flies that, that you get uh, uh, both these little semicircles and you get uh, some wax associated with them. The eggs hatch and you get the first stage and then the second and then the third and the fourth and uh, we can see in the upper right picture uh, some old eggs that's what the black uh, objects are eggs that have hatched and various stage uh, of, of white flies in, in development also in the uh, picture on the left instar three and then the instar four are indicated here and one of the things i, I like to, to show with this picture is they can be very difficult to see. I mean, not only are they not moving, but they are fairly translucent and may uh, be very, very difficult to see, particularly on certain kinds of leaves. That four stage, as I mentioned, are sometimes called a pupa, or pupae would be plural. The, this is that fourth non-feeding stage, um, and all the transition from that uh, wingless earlier stage uh, nymph and the adult uh, to the adult take place during this this pupal form. That pupa, that non-feeding fourth instar, uh, is a stage that were you to want to identify a kind of white fly, that's probably what you would use. So indicated here, the if you looked at the, the greenhouse white fly in side view versus the sweet potato white fly in side view in that fourth instar, uh, they look very different. The greenhouse white fly is much taller and, and uh, straight sides, uh, uh, not as uh, tall and a little more convex in body form with the sweet potato white fly. So this shows adults and some of the old skins left behind. They do leave skins behind. Uh, the eggs 
crumple so they don't show up too much, but the, the old skins will be left behind, and they often will tend to move up on the plant, uh, colonizing the, the newer growth over the older growth. White flies, like aphids, suck fluids from the phloem, so they're going to feed in the same way as an aphid. They're going to plumb into the phloem. They're going to take in a lot of, of fluids into their body, and most of what they're going to uh, be uh, taking in is going to be uh, either excreted, or in the case of white flies, much of it's turned into wax. So white flies do excrete some honeydew as a waste product, as do all the phloem feeders that are in this order Hemiptera. Um, but uh, you can have a lot of white flies, and see, here's a, and this is a this is a very heavily infested leaf, and you don't see a lot of, of honeydew. They they produce less of it in part because uh, much of it goes into producing the wax that covers their body, and in the younger stages they might have a wax cover that has spines. And anyway, much of it is is repurposed in the case of of the. Uh, White flies. And if you look at this picture also, though, there is a fair amount of honeydew, but it's in the form of uh, uh, kind of round droplets. Uh, the, the wax of their body uh, allows the, the pooled honeydew to kind of uh, coalesce into balls. So you see little round uh, spheres in this picture, and that's honeydew with the wax from the body causing it to uh, kind of encapsulate into a ball rather than as a fluid that would leave a sticky surface. Uh, but they they do drop some liquid honeydew onto uh, surfaces below them, and of course, if you have honeydew that persists for a long time, regardless of what insect produced it, you get sooty mold. So, what are the issues with white flies? Well, sometimes it's just that they're on something. Uh, in particular, with ornamental plants, just you can't sell them because there's uh, insects on them, and white flies can be visible in the adult stage as they fly about. Uh, they can remove fluids from the phloem. Uh, as we talked about with aphids, they're uh, pretty um, pretty direct in terms of how they access those fluids and, and don't do a lot of damage uh, at the feeding site. So it, it can take quite a few white flies before you're going to see uh, any phys physical effects. But there, there are a couple of issues uh, with toxic saliva, and there are a few viruses that are transmitted by a few white flies. Not the common greenhouse white fly, but, but some. So when we talk about uh, toxic effects, uh, one, one situation that arose is something called the silver leaf condition uh, that is associated with the sweet potato white fly. When Bamesia tabasi, the sweet potato white fly, came into North America, in the 1990s, uh, one of the things that was odd about it was a, a condition, particularly in squash, uh, where you get a silvering of the leaf. And you'd also get uh, irregular fruit ripening uh, in squash family plants, also irregular ripening of some vegetable crops. Uh, tomatoes would not ripen as well if they were on a plant uh, that was affected by sweet potato whitefly, the strain that came in again back in the early 1990s. and. This is a this is a, a, re, a reaction to the saliva that the sweet potato whitefly introduces. Greenhouse whitefly does not do that. Um, also, the sweet potato whitefly is a notorious vector of virus diseases uh, worldwide. Pretty much the only big one that it, they are involved in in moving about is a virus uh, that causes tomato yellow leaf curl, which we find in particularly the uh, southeastern part of the United States now. Uh, but elsewhere in the world, there are other viruses transmitted by sweet potato whitefly. Again, the greenhouse whitefly, the one we normally have in greenhouses, is not a vector of viruses, or at least uh, no, none of the viruses that occur in North America. So we have two main whiteflies. We have the, the greenhouse whitefly and the sweet potato whitefly. Greenhouse whitefly is the most common species in greenhouses in North America. Uh, the sweet potato whitefly is the most common species found on outdoor crops in southern U.S., and it can be found indoors. Um, greenhouse whitefly is not an important vector of plant viruses. Sweet potato whitefly is an important vector of some plant viruses. Greenhouse whitefly produces no unusual growth disorders with the feeding. There's no toxins in saliva that produce some sort of symptom, but sweet potato whitefly you do, the silver leaf condition. And the greenhouse whitefly has had fewer problems with 
uh, developing strains that are resistant to insecticides. Not that they haven't been difficult to control, but uh, compared to the sweet potato whitefly, there have been some uh, very serious strains that have developed, particularly something called the Q biotype that's uh, become established in North America, uh, much more difficult to control than the old beet biotype that was in, in the U.S. So let's again review the, the life cycle a little bit, uh, show in the eggs, the various stages of, of the immature forms and the adult. Um, each of these takes a certain period of time, so in this graph right here, the, that uh, uh, egg, egg might last uh, about a, a week, 10 days, depends on temperatures, but at 70 degrees, maybe 6 to 10 days, maybe 3 to 4 days is that first stage nymph that's moving around, 4 to 5 days is the second stage nymph when it's stopped moving, 4 to 5 days again maybe for the thir fifth, third stage nymph, and, and 6 to 10 days for that last stage. And the adults could live a month, maybe even more. Uh, but all of this is dependent on temperature. So, and you would say that for any insect, not just a whitefly. So, for instance, uh, at 85 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, egg hatch occurs with, in about three days. You can zip through all the first three active feeding stages of the nymphs in another week. The pupa takes about a week. And then there's another day for the adult female to uh, be able to lay eggs, the pre oviposition period. So this is all being completed in about 18 days. That's if the average temperature, average temperature for the day was 85 degrees. Were it to be 65 degrees, it would more than double uh, the life cycle. It would be closer to 40 days for, the, for that species. So uh, when we have warmer temperatures, white flies will have uh, greatly accelerated gener uh, generation times. So what do we do about white flies? If you're in an area that has cold winters, um, you are much more able to control the species because it is incapable of surviving year round outdoors uh, in, a, in an area with freezing temperatures. Uh, white flies as a general group are far more common in the tropics and subtropics. Uh, and there are very few that are found anywhere in an area with freezing winter temperatures regular. So in a place where I live, and some of you may live, uh, outdoor survival does not occur uh, because the winters are cold, they freeze, the plants die. Uh, uh, the developing stages, think of those, the, the, the uh, non-feeding, uh, or the feeding stages, uh, the nymphs, I mean, they require a living host. Um, if if the, they're feeding on a plant and the plant's dead, they will quickly die after that. So there are no plants in, in the winter when it's cold. And the adults, they have to continue to feed to sustain themselves. They don't have a resistant stage. So were you to have a, uh, a host-free period where there was nothing suitable for the adult to feed on, after about three days, they would all be dead too. So this brings up one of the things that's quite important if you do live in an area uh, where there is cold winters. Uh, um, and that is, uh, if you don't have white flies, it can be pretty easy not to get them if you just don't bring them in. The way people uh, will get a problem with white flies on their indoor plants and then maybe in their gardens would be by purchasing a plant that had white flies on it. Uh, so carefully inspect not transplants whenever you are uh, considering a purchase. And don't introduce ones that have white flies. I mean, just say no to white flies. It's a lot easier to do this again in a place where we have a, a period when they uh, aren't surviving outdoors. If you're in Florida, you're in Southern Texas, you're in Southern California, this, this uh, doesn't work because you have uh, uh, the warm weather throughout the, the winter time. But, I mean, this it, it's easy to say, check your plants for them. It's its very difficult to, to do an actual practice. Uh, since these young stages are so difficult to detect visually, you really should put any new plants, any plants that you think may have white flies on them, in a quarantine area separate from all your other plants, and leave them there until enough time has passed for any of the developing white flies on those plants to have turned into an adult, a winged adult. The winged adults, you can see, you touch the plant, they'll fly up. Uh, you can use traps. We'll talk about that in just a sec. Uh, but 
that would be at least two weeks, maybe even two, three or four weeks. Uh, uh, so that would that would be a way to prevent new ones getting in. Make to get a quarantine period to, uh, in part of your thinking if you are bringing in in these new plants. Now there are traps that are widely used for white flies. Um, yellow works. Uh, white white sticky white traps work too, but you just can't see them very well on that. Um, so these these are uh, widely used to monitor indoors for white flies as for other insects. They would also catch uh, winged aphids. They might catch um, fungus nets and some other indoor uh, kinds of insects. But one of the questions um, that I want to pose is can sticky traps control white flies? Because I see people using sticky traps because they get a sense that, you know, it helps. So you'll see lots of sticky traps being put out. Does it control white flies? And that's a separate question than does it catch white flies? So sticky traps for white flies can capture adult white flies and they are useful for monitoring changes in populations of white flies. Uh, so you would uh, be able to know if the numbers are increasing or decreasing. Uh, so any kinds of actions you've taken, you could evaluate them. So they're good for that. They're good for monitoring. And they catch the adults, the adults of the wing stage. But what they don't catch is, is any of the immature stages, of course, because these aren't even moving. And they never capture all the adult white flies. So yes, you catch some, but you don't catch all, and you don't catch the young. So sticky traps can be one component of a white fly control program. Uh, but they are certainly not the only thing uh, you could use to, to control white flies if you had a problem. There are a lot of biological controls, uh, particularly used indoors, but they're, they're also used in outdoor crops in this country too. So uh, there are certain parasitic or parasitoid wasps that occur. There's a kind of lady beetle that is in the market. We also use some uh, uh, enemapathogenic fungi, fungi that attack insects. The uh, most common, or, or, or the, certainly the, the, the ones that have been used longest, are little tiny wasps, uh, the white fly parasites. These are tiny little wasps that, uh, that lay their eggs in the developing stages of white flies, and then the young of the wasp develops within the white fly and ultimately kills it. The one that has been uh, used the most is in Carcia formosa. It is a parasite of the greenhouse white fly. And it has been used for almost 100 years now. This is the first insect that was ever uh, used in, in a, an applied biological control manner in greenhouses by the Dutch. Um, and it can be effective. Uh, when they lay their eggs in a white fly, the young develop within that white fly. And then that white fly looks different. Um, so in the picture in the lower right, the, the black ones are ones that have been successfully attacked by the, this greenhouse white fly. Very easy to see. Um, now, this, this can be quite effective, but any living organism has some kind of optimum uh, when they do better and outside of which they, they don't perform as well. And in the case of the greenhouse white fly, it is a fairly warm temperature species. So you would have to have temperatures averaging averaging uh, day and night uh, above about 72 degrees for this insect to effectively suppress a uh, greenhouse whitefly. If it's colder than that, they, they both uh, slow down, but the parasitoid slows down more than the whitefly. It gets warmer, the whitefly parasitoid does better. But about 72 degrees is about the cutoff point, even consider this. Uh, again, the, the ones that are parasitized are very um, very distinctive, look like little pepper grains, uh, and these are widely sold. Uh, this picture in the lower left is a hang card, and in the middle of that is a little uh, area, a little oval area that had a little uh, tacky uh, 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 material on it to which uh, parasitized white flies were attached, and these were hung, and then the wasps emerge. Another uh, one that's in the market is Eretmosaurus. Uh, this is uh, one that goes after uh, both sweet potato and greenhouse whitefly. So this is getting quite a bit of use too. There is one lady beetle that is sometimes sold and uh, these are sometimes also introduced into outdoor growing situations. A, a predatory lady beetle used to manage sweet potato whitefly. 
not the greenhouse whitefly. And then there's um, some some fungi on the bottom. There's two two kinds of fungi that are sold that are used as sprays. That these can be sprayed on foliage to control a lot of different kinds of insects, including whiteflies. One of them is Bovaria bassiana, and the other is Isaria fumosa rosea. So these are again pathogenic enema pathogenic fungi, fungi that develop within insects and. Uh, the Bovary bassiana is the best known, goes under trade names like Botanigard and uh, Naturalis mycotrol. The aphid on the right is uh, covered with spores. Uh, when you get high humidity conditions, the infected aphid, uh, will, the spores will emerge from the body. Uh, the one on the left is also infected, but uh, it doesn't have the, the fuzzy appearance uh, because the spores haven't erupted out. It needs to be high humidity for that to happen. So I'll just leave uh, with this uh, life cycle again of the white flies, in this, this case uh, one provided by the University of Kentucky. And uh, we'll move on now to some other insects that feed with sucking mouth parts.